something that I will have to work on. But we are excited to spend the next hour with you. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me as always, am I pointing the right way? Is yes, Lisa. Are. Lisa, Hi. who are we? We are the hosts of Not Crazy, the <laughs> best podcast that you should be listening to at psychcentral.com slash not crazy. It's I'm getting so good at reading that out loud. Mental health podcast. Mental health podcast. <laughs> One of the things that you're going to notice about the next hour is that Lisa will talk over me constantly. <laughs> I I'm think working on it. Oh. I know. I told her, "Hey, we're going to go live," and Lisa started saying, "Oh, I hate this mirror image. I don't know why that is. I just the professionalism is 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 tops." Lisa and I have known each other for 20 years. We used to be married, in case you couldn't tell by the bickering, and now we're divorced happily. And well, now we have a podcast. I, I mean, what mm -hmm. else was there to do? The next hour, what we're going to do is we are going to answer every single question that we have time to answer about living with mental illness, about depression, bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, mental health issues we can handle, COVID-19, what's going on in the world. There is no question too big or too small. All you need to do is put it in the comments section. And the awesome woman who is behind the scenes, who you will not see or hear, who is helping us will put them on the screen. So yeah, just ask your questions in the comments. While we're waiting on those to queue up, and, and sincerely, I, I can't believe there's not already a hundred. Lisa, yes. tell us all about you. Like you have like 60 seconds to oh, define. You should have warned me. I could have written something down. Um, well, <laughs> here we are. We're doing the mental health podcast. I have struggled with depression all my life. I have been well medicated since my 20s. There has been some ups and downs um, a couple of times where I stopped taking my meds because I'm an idiot. But when I took them, it really usually turned out pretty well. So I've been well, make ugh, well medicated since I was in my 20s. And depression has been very well under control, mostly. You know, Lisa, I, I want to ask you, this is a question that comes up a lot. So we'll just, we'll just start it right out of there. You always bring up whenever you tell your personal story, well medicated, well medicated, well medicated. You, you must mention medication in your personal story five times in 30 seconds. You, you, I in feel, fact, you, you didn't mention therapy at all, which is the, why is that? I, I did do therapy. I do think therapy helped, but the thing for me, I think was the really driving force was the medication. The medication is really what did it. It was the first thing I did before I ever did therapy and it made such an immediate difference. And, you know, I, I haven't had therapy in years, but I take that pill every day. So and every time I stop taking the pill, I get way worse. But every time I stop going to therapy, I don't get way worse. So I feel like the medication is the number one thing for me. I, everybody's different. You know, this is, I am going to jump all over you here. Because you say that when you oh, don't good. go to therapy, you don't get way worse. Well, it, it is true. When you don't go to therapy, you you don't become suicidal. And I know that when you're not right. on your meds, which, you know, which is suicide is, is a real concern. But you become irritable. You don't leave your house. You become anxious. You become impossible to be around and you'll go months without smiling, enjoying life, or, or frankly, talking to anybody. And you don't describe that as way worse. When you do go to therapy, and I remember I've, I've known everybody, I have known her for 20 years. I'm not just making stuff up. But when you do go to therapy, you you have coping skills and you 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 reframe. I always do this reframe. You you balance out your life in in in, in really better ways. Why is it that you feel that the only recovery from depression is not wanting to die? So like if you achieve like one tiny level past that where you don't want to live, but you don't want to die, uh, you're like, oh, I've done it. I don't need to do anything else. I'm pushing you on purpose because I, I think it's a I think it's a sad message that the that, that mental health advocacy should be about merely surviving rather than mental health advocacy should be about living well. Well, I guess recovery is self-defined. And in my mind, I see some of those things as being more just my personality or I, I don't see them as being intrinsically linked to my depression. I see them as being other things. I, that may or may not be accurate. I, I don't Lisa, know what to say, it's a personal feeling. Credit. I will give you full credit for owning that part of your personality is simply being miserable. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and and again, I struggle with depression since the time I was a child, and I've wondered about that a lot. How much of 
And of course, when I first started taking meds, I also wondered about that, as we all do. How much of this was me? How much is my personality? Where do I start? And the medication begin, blah, 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 blah. So it becomes this very, what's the word I'm looking for? Not esoteric. Ah, well, there's a word. And yeah, for me, that's just always been a big part of it. And I do recognize, and you have scolded me before, that not being depressed is not just about not wanting to kill yourself. And that's a pretty low bar, but I don't know. It's, it's the bar that I have self-defined. Uh, Lisa, I completely understand. And obviously you're not going to get any more pushback from me. This has been fun. All right, let's get to the questions. All right. Question number one is coming on the screen now. Lisa, can you see that? Yeah, I can see it. All okay, right. You read it. Okay, Chelsea Circle asks, how do you deal with people that think you're just being lazy, specifically with housework? Well, okay, I guess was, Gabe doesn't have an answer to that. He's not a big houseworker. Um, <laughs> I guess it depends. <laughs> well, that kind of goes back to what I just said. That's very difficult to know where are you just being lazy? I mean, after all, everybody is in fact lazy. How do you tell the difference? Where do you start? Where does your depression start? It's a very difficult thing to do. I would say that if you're having trouble with your friends or family, just education. The more education you can give them about mental illness and about your personal struggles with mental illness, what you're doing, how you're trying to get better, probably the better off. So Gabe? For, yeah, Lisa, of course. For, for me, it, it's, it's interesting the way that we push people away. And I, I don't mean we, I just mean like like society. And it's it's interesting that I know so many people with with no mental health issues whatsoever. Like I am just uber jealous of their mental healthiness <laughs> and their places are a wreck. Like they're just a straight up mess. My sister, I love my sister. And if she is watching, I apologize. Her house, trashy. I, I don't know why she has no mental illness to speak of, but, but nobody ever says that this is some sort of uh, intrinsic flaw in her. Uh, although, as my sister has pointed out, she is the mom of a five-year-old, and, and apparently people judge her uh, for having a messy house because of children. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that people will find a way to judge you, whether you have mental illness, children, no, no matter what you do, people will find a way to judge you. So the question that I want you to ask yourself is, are you annoyed with them because you're, they're right? Do you agree with them? Do you think that your house is messy or that you need to do more house or housework or there is a problem? Ask yourself when, when you're alone, you don't need to involve them in any way. Is the reason that they're annoying you so much is because it, you agree with them? And then let that be the impetus for change. If you're happy with the way your house is, just, just let it go. Let it just let it, what is it, water off a duck's back, Lisa? I'm, I'm not yes. up on my, I'm not up on my pithy quotes. I, I do think, and, and I want to say this, this strongly, if people are coming to your house or into your life just to do nothing but criticize you, you really need to consider having the talk, which is, listen, I don't want you in, your, in my life if all you're going to do is criticize me. Like, like, these are the choices that I have made. They do not impact you. Th this, is, this is a non-starter for us. Please do not bring it up again. And then if they don't respect that boundary, off they go. But, but again, I, I do want to say, talk about this a lot, sometimes I'm mad at Lisa because of the things that she tells me is not because of what she told me. It's because she's right and I don't want to face it. So it's easier to be mad at her than admit to it. Th this is a little... I agree with that. It's a little codependent yeah. game that we play. Uh, so ask yourself that first. But second, if, if they're just being jerks, out of your life. I know easier said than done. All right, you ready for the next question, Lisa? Absolutely. Tina Meyer asks, did you find the right medication off the bat or did you have to go through some different med trials? Oh, I'm going like to take this one. Okay, you'll take I that like one. I have two. I like to say... That, that from the time I, I went to the hospital unexpectedly, I, I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. I didn't even know that I was sick. I was put on my first psychiatric medications. And that, that, was, that was day one, day one in the life of Gabe Howard's journey with bipolar disorder. And it took me four years to reach recovery from that date. And in that four years, I had to go through a lot of ups and downs with medication. Sometimes the medications would work great on my depression, but they would cause side effects, whether it be, you know, weight gain, sexual side effects, dry mouth, lethargy that make me sleep 20 hours a day. The goal here is, is it just to find medication that treat the symptoms? It's to find medications that treat the symptoms 
that, of course, that, that you can tolerate and live your best life with. So uh, what I want to tell you uh, unequivocally is it took a long time to find the right medications. And for me, I, I live with bipolar disorder. And Lisa is getting ready to tell you a similar story, only less <laughs> enthusiastically. I, I'm not less enthusiastic. I just don't have as much practice as you do. I also you ha had to go through many drugs before I found the one that was the right for me. And then, of course, the thing they don't tell you is that and then sometimes time just stops working. And because something has changed, you know, your your physiology has changed. Maybe you gain weight, you lose weight. For me, I'm getting older. And the drug that you've been relying on for years, if not longer, is suddenly not working anymore. And then you have to go through that whole trial and error process all over again to find the one that you're stable on again. So it can be very frustrating. I think we I think I read a study somewhere that said like the average person with depression tried. It was something like five. It's really high. So that's very common. Almost everyone goes through multiple drugs before they find the right one. I, I love saying this. I, I, I swear we say it almost every episode. So it just, I, I'm just excited to say it again. You know, headaches, headache medication. There, there's what? There's like, there's like five or six that we can name off of, uh, off the top of our head, like Aleve, Tylenol, like Excedrin, Advil. Of course, there, there, there's aspirin. We forgot all of that. That's like, that's like, I'm not even a doctor. That's like five different medications. And, and all of us for, for, for a simple headache uh, have a different medication that we like a different medic and we take different amounts. You know, I, I, I'm in the Tylenol camp as is Lisa, but I take three and she takes two. So even though we're on the same, the, actually, I think Lisa's an Advil person. I've just, I've just, I'm an aspirin person. Oh, she's an aspirin person. That's a I know simple so incredibly headache. important to correct, it, but it's a simple headache yeah. and you can see the, the, Something the, that everybody gets and humans have been dealing with for millennia. And yet, we have all these different choices. If one pill, one shot worked for everybody, we wouldn't need doctors. We wouldn't even need pharmacists. We would just have vending machines. You would just go to the vending machine and tell you tell it what's wrong with you, and it would just spit out the cure. And it doesn't work that way, which is why we have, you know, higher of, of, of doctors and nurses and pharmacists and all these people to help take care of you because it's just really, really complicated, and everybody is different. I don't know, Lisa. I think you just invented an app. I mean, it won't work, but I, I, I think that that is like an app. Just like type in your symptoms and it'll tell you what's wrong and dispense accordingly. Well, my <laughs> I, my husband actually does this to me a lot. Bless his little heart. But I'll say something like, oh, I have a headache. And he's like, well, did you take something? And I'm like, well, yeah, but it hasn't kicked in yet or it's not working yet. He's like, well, are you sure? Are you sure you still have a headache? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So... You know, there is this attitude some people have that, well, if you've taken the medication correctly, it will work. It must be your fault. You must have done something wrong. That's why you can't get on the right, the right regimen. No, not necessarily. Certainly that can yeah. be a factor, but no, not necessarily. The human body is complicated. It, it, it's very interesting, uh, you know, in, in the comment section, uh, you know, there, there's uh, there, there's some questions brewing about, you know, medication versus therapy and and, and how the two relate. And, I, and it's, it, it's, it's an incredible conversation. I, I wish I could just read the whole thing to you, but we don't have time for this. But one of the things it's saying is that sometimes we expect too much from medication because we don't have therapy to go along with it to, to help understand our expectations. And sometimes we're expecting the pill to be magical. Uh, meaning we want to take it and everything to be perfect rather than medication just helping us getting to the point where we can be the best that we can be, uh, you know, getting us into the zone uh, for, for lack of a better term. And then we have to start doing the hard work, you know, uh, kind of like putting on the winter coat uh, that does part of it, but you still have to walk out the front door. Uh, putting on the winter coat doesn't magically get you into the outdoors. It, it's just a step. Uh, and I agree with all of this thing. I, I, I really see all of this stuff going hand in hand. So I just, I wanted to acknowledge that conversation was going on and just really validate it is, yeah, I think that we need to do everything that we can to get well, not just one or the other. Uh, I know that wasn't your question, Tina, uh, specifically about having to try different medications and how normal that is. Um, but but it, it it happened to catch my eye and I wanted to Put it in there. All right, are we ready for the next well, question? Let me just make one small comment about that. I remember right. you saying years ago, Gabe, you saying that the purpose of medication was to get you to a place where therapy would help. That if, when you were super, super down, you just, you know, when you're suicidal, really bad, therapy just might not do enough for you or you're not getting the full benefit from it. So maybe medication gets you into a place where you can benefit from other treatment. 
Yeah, and everybody's results may vary absolutely unequivocally. So the, uh, I, I, again, I, I know that that's just a conversation. I just I, I love the side conversations. I, I believe that we learn so much from one another. Uh, I think it's really really important to uh, you know approach all of these conversations like a buffet. Take what you want and leave the rest. And remember, there's no reason to walk up to the food that you didn't take and call it names and say how much you hate salad. We all know that salad ain't great. But uh, some people prefer it, and that's okay because it's not our lives. All right, ready for the next question, Lisa? Yes, absolutely. All, All right, right, Bonnie Patter Bonnie Patterson asks, "How do you talk to an inpatient family member that doesn't think anything is wrong with them?" So the denial is, and yeah, and oh, that is a question. What? It dropped off, Bonnie Patterson. How do you talk to an inpatient family member that doesn't think anything is wrong with them? So the denial is in the. Well, I, I admittedly, I do not know what the end of that sentence was going to be, but I think we can, we can extrapolate from the beginning. And yeah, that's an excellent question. And it's one we get asked almost every time we do, we do this or go anywhere else, or it is the number one question that Gabe is asked at all speaking events always, which is how do I convince someone who is not realizing that they're in a bad way, that they are in a bad way. And you know, if there was is, an answer to that. I, I'm, I'm fond of saying that if I could come up with the answer, I would just have dump trucks full of money and I would just fully fund the mental health safety nets. Uh, and, and, and I, and therapy would be free. Uh, I would, I would just dump billions of dollars into research. Um, but, but listen, I, I want to say a little bit about this because it, I understand this desire, and not because it's a mental illness. Let, let, let's let's move that aside. Let's talk about the, the human condition. I understand the desire to believe that nothing is wrong with us. I understand the desire to believe that there is nothing wrong with me in, in spite of overwhelming evidence. And, and even though I've been managing bipolar disorder for going on 17 years now, I would be lying if I said that I never lied awake at night and thought, maybe I don't. Maybe I'm fine. You know, why are all these people judging me? Or started comparing myself to others. That, that's my favorite game when I'm depressed is to find other people with bipolar disorder. Because, and, and like I'll read a blog about how they did something with bipolar disorder that I can't do. And I'll think, well, see, see that now, now I can do it because Natasha Tracy did it. Or uh, I can do it because uh, Electro Boy Andy Berman did it. Or, you know, just, just all. Or, or, then I start like claiming fictional character status. So I, I wanna say that I, I think that it is innately human to want to believe the best in ourselves and for look for reasons to believe that we're not sick. I don't know that that, that is a mental illness, although mental illness can certainly exacerbate this issue. As far as what to do with your loved one, like, like how to talk to them about it, this is what Lisa did to me and I'm gonna start it and I'm gonna let her finish it. Lisa asked me what was wrong and she asked me questions and she asked me where I wanted to go. And she talked to me about goal setting and, and, and how badly I felt. And Lisa just asked a lot of Gabe, how do you feel about Gabe? What do you want out of life? Gabe, where do you want to be? Gabe, what do you want to improve? And then we partnered on ways to make them better. Now I didn't accept all of her all of her guidance in the beginning. And this is where Lisa broke out her secret weapon. She said, look, if you're not willing to do it for yourself, are you willing to do it for me? And uh, I, I'm going to let Lisa talk about this because she's going to do a way better job about it. But I, I just want to state that there were a lot of things that I was unwilling to do for myself, but I was absolutely willing to do for uh, my wife and, and my friend. Uh, Lisa, why was the, I mean, you, you knew to do this. Were you just shooting in the dark and hoping what, you know, to discuss this? Because it's been a very powerful thing in my life. Well, and from the other side of it, I can understand you're thinking to yourself, why can't they see what's wrong? And we all think that. We all think, well, if you would just be able to sit someone down and explain clearly to them, then they would understand. And you think that about everything, not just mental illness, like politics. And you think, oh my goodness, how can that, how can he possibly think this about this political issue? Well, if I could just talk to him and explain it, you know, right there, he would understand and we wouldn't have this disagreement. The problem is no one's explained it to him adequately. 
And it, it just doesn't work like that in real life. So I understand this feeling that you can talk them into it. You can convince them if you just find the right words. And there aren't necessarily the right words. And I would say that the number one thing to do would be to look at what it is they want. Because everyone... I'm going to mess it up, but I saw this, this schizophrenic lady talking one time and she said that when she was a teenager, people said to her, okay, here are your goals. And, and number one on the goal, goal list is hygiene, right? She's like, well, that wasn't my goal. Well, so when people say to you, oh, we know you're sick because you're doing the following things or you need to stop doing the following things. Well, maybe he doesn't think so. Maybe this person feels that they're, that this in particular is not the problem. So Try to talk to them and figure out what is it that they want to work on? What is their goal? What are they trying to get better at? Maybe their goal isn't to get a job. Maybe their goal is to find stable housing or just whatever it might be. And try to work with that, with what it is they want. And then, of course, when you're doing all this, you have to remember, and I know it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, it's just so frustrating that this person is sick. They're not right. They, they have a mental illness. Their thinking is flawed. So when you're trying to use reason and logic, and there is a place for that, there is a place for rational thinking or thinking it through. But if you're trying to reason it out, by definition, this person is not able to reason adequately. This person is not thinking clearly. So, you know, what do you do with that? You, you might have to trick them, frankly. And yes, I agree with what Gabe said, that a lot of times people aren't willing to do anything. I don't know what relationship you have with this person, but see if you can get them to do it as a favor to you. Look, I understand that you don't want to do this, but please do it as a personal favor for me. You don't want to do it, fine, but do it for me. Just do it as a personal favor to me to make me happy or even to make me stop annoying you. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was so wonderful about this method, Lisa, is I thought, I don't want to do this because I don't think it's going to work and it's going to be a waste of time. But mm -hmm. I had, but now that was removed. I was doing it to make Lisa happy. So therefore, it in my mind, time anymore. I had a hundred percent success rate. If I did it, Lisa would be happy equals success. So my motivation for doing it was simply to make my 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 friend, my wife happy. And I, I think, I, again, I, I like to talk about mental illness in the scope of just, you know, reasonable human life. I think we all do this. I, I saw Hamilton. I am not a musical kind of guy, but my wife wanted to see it. So why did I buy tickets and go see Hamilton? I did it to make my wife happy. Uh, it's the same thing with all kinds of stuff. My, my friend Lisa here, I'm almost putting the right way. My friend Lisa, not a hockey fan. She goes to hockey games all the time because it makes her friend Gabe happy. So her goal is not to enjoy the hockey game. Her goal is to enjoy time with Gabe. So this is really, this is just part of the human condition. And I think we forget that. Sincerely, I think we forget that sometimes when we're dealing with people who suffer from severe and persistent mental illness, especially those who are unaware that they're suffering. We forget that they're not just mentally ill people. They're not just sick people. They're not just people living with fill-in medical diagnosis there. A at their base, they're people who are sick. And a lot of the same rules apply. And, and I, I, I do think that it's smart to, to remember that. And it, it's also, as Lisa said, it, it's smart to be like really, really patient because it, it's easy yes. to lose your temper. And that it's doesn't so help easy. anyone. All right, we ready for the next question? Absolutely. All right. And the next question is, any tips on dealing with bad social anxiety? You have come to the right place for tips. <laughs> Lisa, so I have an anxiety disorder, but I, I do not feel specifically that social anxiety is my issue. I really, really dig people, right? So, yeah. but, but Lisa, you have, a, a, I'm not going to say horrible social anxiety, but you unequivocally I do have, some, have social yeah. anxiety. What What are your thoughts? Um, It's a difficult subject for me just because I, I do recognize that I am anxious about a lot of social interactions, but it doesn't really bother me personally. I would be okay with just not having the social interaction, but it <laughs> bothers all the people around you. They don't like it at all. So, you know, you don't get to have what you want. Um, I would say that the number one thing that helps me with social anxiety is, well, and this is kind of facile, but forcing yourself to do it because the anxiety is at its peak when it starts, right? Like in the first 
at the party is the very worst time, but it gets way better after that. So if you can get in the door, you it's downhill from there. So that has been helpful for me, just this knowledge that it'll be over in a minute. And don't think to yourself, oh my God, I'm going to feel this way for the next hour or three hours, however long this party is. No, it, it goes away dramatically once you get over, or at least for me, once you get over that first hump. And then a thing that always helped you, Gabe, is... I, and I, again, this sounds kind of foolish, but practice. Like, what is it? Try yeah. to narrow down. What specifically are you anxious about? Are you anxious that you're going to be late? Are you anxious that you're not going to look right? Are you anxious that your hair looks dumb? So try to figure out exactly what it is that's bothering you. And what can you do about that? Like, could you solve this whole problem if you just had a better outfit? which again, I know sounds foolish, but sometimes it works. But if you're worried about, well, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to get there. Practice. Go go the day before. So make sure you know how to drive there. Make sure you know where to park. Make sure you you know the layout of the restaurant. That might make you feel better. The the big thing that, that always helped me was the, the, the pre-planning. The, the, the number of times that I drove to an event the day before to ensure that I, I knew how to get there uh, I, I did that all the time, and that was for things that I couldn't bring. My 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 preferred my 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 preferred choice is the buddy system. I, I bring a friend, even if it was just like, oh, Gabe, you don't need to bring somebody. Absolutely. Now, I I'm I was I was very fortunate. I could say, hey, can I bring my wife? And that's that's like real easy. If you're in a relationship, can I bring my significant other? You usually don't get any pushback from that. Uh, it, it is more difficult if you know you're invited to an office party and you're like, hey, can I bring my friend? Oh, that, that's weird. But, but one, I, I believe that this is just becoming more and more socially acceptable because people spend a lot less time trying to figure out who you're hanging out with now. I think this is, you know, people are getting less nosy. Uh, you know, I'm 43 years old. When I first started my career, if I walk into a business function with a woman, it was assumed that she was my wife, significant other, et cetera. And I got to tell you now at 43, I walk into places all the time and people don't even care who is with me. Like they, they don't, I, I do think that the world is improving in, 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 in small ways. We're starting to realize that it is inappropriate to describe people as Gabe's guest. They just say, hi, what's your name? And then they know them as, you know, Lisa, John, Jim, whatever. Uh, so, and this, this all leads me to say that I was shocked the amount of people who were not thinking about me. Ooh, A lot of my social that. anxiety came from, I just assumed that the whole party was everybody watching Gabe, judging Gabe, commenting on Gabe, discussing Gabe, wondering what Gabe was up to, and then I don't know, like 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 holding up numbers to see how Gabe did. And I learned that actually, really nobody cared. Yeah. I, I mean, sincerely, and I don't mean that mean. I just they all had their own issues. They all had their own goals, or people that they wanted to network with, or meet, or or food that they wanted to get to before it was eaten, or what? What are they? They had their own problems. I, it, it is helpful for me to realize that hey, most of the people really don't give a rat's behind what I'm up to. That that helped. Yeah. I think that's excellent advice because yeah, you have this idea that everyone's looking at you and everyone cares. Yeah, do you care about any of them? You don't care what any of them are up to. So why do you think they care about you? And I have a story. When I was in college, I was at class on the first day and this girl walked in a little bit late and she tripped as she walked in. And of course, the door is in the very front of the room. She trips, she falls down, she she you know loses all of her papers. It's horribly embarrassing. She just looked like a complete idiot, right? And then about 10 minutes later, it, they did that thing where you go around the room and tell us one thing about yourself, right? And you know, hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, I'm so-and-so. And when they got to her, she said, hi, I'm Jenny. And I'm the one who just tripped in the door. And I actually thought, oh my God, I forgot. I had forgotten all about it. Like I didn't even remember that that had happened until she mentioned it again. So, you know, other people don't care about you. They're not, I was paying no attention to this girl, but she thought we all had been doing nothing but thinking about her that entire time. And I had completely forgot that happened when it was time for her to say hello. So other people aren't paying as much attention to as you think. I, I have to tell you, as somebody that, that does this, you know, for, for, for a living where I want people to pay attention to me, I want people to remember me, I want people to, to see me on The Mighty and Psych Central and, and listen to the Not Crazy podcast and on and on and on. Those people aren't even paying attention. And I am deliberately trying <laughs> to get you to pay attention. 
Uh, so uh, people just aren't accidentally consuming content. Like we have to be so on purpose. Like we took showers for this. <laughs> I'm wearing more makeup now than I wear when I actually leave the house. It's bizarre. So uh, That's awesome. All right. We are ready for the next. Lisa, are you ready for the next question? I'm totally ready are. for the next question. I just, I just don't even bother to ask. All right. Riley Madison asks, when will life feel worth it? The positives do not outweigh the negatives. I'm stuck and I hate it. Just FYI, we had to shorten the question just to fit on the screen. No other reason. Thank you, Riley. So let, let's 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 have sort of a of a of a you know a, a, a straight shooter kind of conversation. I, I understand that feeling very much, and uh, I, I I know how you feel. And there was a point in my life where I would have completely agreed with you. I, I would have sat in whatever dark room, whatever dark hole, and I would have said the positives do not outweigh the negative. You are you are absolutely right. And I would have been wrong. I would have been completely wrong. And the reason I would have been wrong is because maybe it was true in that moment. I I sincerely kind of doubt it, but but I, I don't live your life. Maybe right now for this moment, the the positives do not outweigh the negative. But this is this is a single slice in time. We 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 live so long and we accomplish so much and we meet so many people. If I had been successful all those years ago, back in 2003, I never would have met my wife. I, I never would have married Lisa. I never would have divorced Lisa. <laughs> I, I, I never, I think of all of the wonderful things that I've done. And listen, the wonderful things I've done, they're, they're so lame. I got a dog. I went to the Rolling Stones concert. I, I, I saw the KISS final tour. It was all right. But I, I, I saw San Francisco. These are things that I had not done back in 2003. These are now positives that, that help offset those negatives. The next thing I want to talk about is that, you know, our brains, they're, they're evil. I, I just I just want to say that the mental illness is insidious and it, and it attaches to you and it knows us so well because it lives in us and it it figures out your buttons and it, it doesn't just push them it like mashes them in and your brain, which is suffering from mental illness, is telling you that the negatives outweigh the positives. It's lying. I, I can't be more clear on that. This is why it is an illness. Now, I, I, don't, I don't have the solution to beat this, but I have an idea. And this worked for me. That's all I can say. But it was so helpful. It's called a mood journal. It used to be called an emotions diary, but I changed the name because apparently I got some toxic masculinity things going on in the background. So I liked mood journal better. And now before you get this idea that you have to write, you know, prose and dozens of paragraphs, the mood journal I kept was just so incredibly simple. I wrote the date. So we're going to pretend it's June 1st. June 1st. I wrote what time I woke up and I used the number one, two, and three. One, I felt bad. Two, I felt okay. Three, I felt great. And that's it. The time I woke up, one, two, three. And then at night, I wrote the time that I went to bed and then one, two, three. That's it. That's it. One, I felt bad. Two, or whatever number I gave earlier. Nobody rewind because I've already forgotten my own system. But just one, two, or three. One, two, or three. And I kept it for a week. And at the end of that week, I asked myself, Gabe, how do you think you did? And I was like, the whole week sucked. It was awful. There was never any happiness. I guarantee it. And then I looked at my own handwriting. Majority twos. I, I, I said that I was just, you know, mostly just meh. Not happy, not sad, just just bored, just just okay, just mediocre. Mediocre is not negative or positive. As far as I'm concerned, mediocre is positive because most of our lives are humdrum and boring. Most of our lives have to be humdrum. Could you imagine if everything was positive 100% of the time? Oh my, that, that's mania. That's what I've just described bipolar <laughs> mania. <laughs> but who am I going to believe? When people tell you your life's not so bad and they give you examples, they're so easy to dismiss. But I believed myself. It was right there in my own handwriting. That, that I remember when part, you did that. I was just meh. Lisa, yeah, you were there. What are your thoughts? It was, yeah. That that was, I actually have yet since then because you were, it was stunning. Because yeah, you're, when I'm depressed, 
I can only remember bad things. Like even if yesterday I had a great day, I don't remember that the next day because the depression just like sucks. It like goes backwards in time and sucks the joy out. So that was actually super helpful because yeah, looking back, I thought to myself, oh no, I didn't have a good day even once this week. I was terrible all week. And it was like, whoa, huh. I guess I wasn't remembering that correctly. And for me personally, I, I'm sorry, there's no magic perfect answer, but yeah, we do know how you feel. And a lot of people know how you feel. You're certainly not alone. I, I have struggled with periods of intense suicidality. And for me, and I don't know if this is good or bad, it's happened to me more than once. And on the plus side, I now know that it ends. So like the last time it happened, I could think to myself, okay, I know that this is finite. I feel terrible now. It's always eventually with help, care, treatment, medication, therapy. It it has gotten better it itself. So if I can hang on for however long it takes, it will get better again. And And I have been through this multiple times. And every time, if I can just hang on, it, it gets better in the end. It eventually goes away. But yeah, it's extremely horrible. It's extremely awful and extremely frustrating. And sometimes it takes a really long time. But the thing that Probably my mom pointed thing. out to me, oh, the thing that my mom pointed out to me all those years ago was, okay, let's say you're going to feel terrible for three months, right? But you're probably going to live to be 80. So, you know, when you, you do a percentage genes. basis, well, yeah, we have, well, I don't have good genes, but yes, all the family has good genes. So <laughs> it seems when you're in the moment, like it's forever, like yeah. it'll never end. But when you look through the course of all this time, it's not as bad as it seems. Well, no, I not as that. long as it seems. I guess that's better. Riley, we believe in you. We have been there. You are not alone. Uh, I want to, I want to say it is, it is awesome that you reached out for help. People don't realize that, you, you know, texting on a, on a live show on, on, you know, the mighty psych central, et cetera, th th this is you doing something. This is one of the ways that I think our, our brain, like why I'm not trying you, you, you saw that something was going on that could beneficially help you. You, you tuned in, then you asked a question, then you listened to the question. Those are three things that you did to improve your situation. Give yourself credit for the small victories. More often than not, the more I talk to people, the more successful they are, and they just didn't realize it. I suffer from the exact same thing. I walk around feeling mostly like a chronic failure, and it, 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 it's, it's not supported by the facts. It just it takes somebody reminding me. And, and we want to remind you. Finally, uh, please reach out to uh, the emergency room, the doctor, general practitioner, family member, or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK uh, because we want to make sure that you're here tomorrow. So you can do it, Riley. All right, you ready for the next question? Absolutely. All right. All right, Amanda Peterson is asking, how can one not allow depression to end? <laughs> How can one not allow depression to end? I assume you're saying to enter into the workplace. So you don't want to bring your depression to work. Well, again, excellent question. <laughs> and that would be another million dollar question with a million dollar answer. Um, that, yeah, it's difficult because obviously when you're depressed, when you have major depression, it's not like it just goes away for eight hours a day. It's not like, oh, this is only in your personal life. No, you feel terrible all the time. I actually hadn't realized how poorly a, a job of hiding it until I got back and when I was in college and one of my professors actually said to me oh, you seem so much better lately you were so down you just seem so ill and I thought you know I didn't even know you knew my name right this, there's a class of a couple dozen people and you remember that I that's how much I was telegraphing depression really so yeah you you don't realize it how do you get it to not enter the work entirely possible because it goes wherever you go. Do you have any Part thoughts? I think is, is, yeah, I think it is self-awareness and control. One, this, this is this is where, you know, therapy, support groups, peer support, uh, having, you know, understanding uh, uh, friends who can help give you tips to your specific situation is incredibly valuable. You know, we, we have to sort of talk about it from the 30,000 foot view. Uh, first off, it's going to enter the workplace. I, I just I just want to let you know, Lisa said, depression follows you everywhere.
elsewhere. It's going to be a personal relationship at home when you're minding your own business, and it's certainly going to be in the workplace. So I, I don't want you to set yourself to fail by saying, okay, I want to be a completely different person devoid of emotions, feelings, or mental illness when I'm in this building. Because that's not asking is how do I control it because I, I don't want it to, you know, come out. Affect your work. Yeah. And get fired and make it yeah, worse. Yeah. I don't want it to. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want it to affect that. That's, that's, thank you, Lisa. Plus that it's is, personal. That is much more. I'm sustained. sorry. I know I'm interrupting you, but the thing that always no, is because no, no, no. you don't want it to affect your work. You don't want other people to look down at you. You certainly, usually for me anyway, don't want to have to tell people that you have depression and it's personal. It's none of their, especially your coworkers. It's none of their business. It's not their yeah, concern what you're so, going through. So, Yep, we get it, Lisa. Nobody wants to have it at work. I think Amanda got it too. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, at work, you can have real realistic and of your of your it's not the job for you. I, I live by pool. Probably was screaming at me. I thought this was a really good job because I can fix things really, really fast. Uh, so I got the job. I got hired. I had the skill set. Boom, something broke. Everybody started yelling at me. I had a giant panic attack, cried, quit the job. It was not the job for me. I thought it was the job for me, but it wasn't. I had to go find a job that I was better suited for uh, because my depression, my mental illness, my anxiety did not allow me to do that job. Um, but the, the next thing that I'll say is, you know, figure out what you can do in the confines of your workplace. The next job that I had, I was I was much smarter about, and I thought, okay. So I started nine. My depression worse is when I feel rushed, when I when I, my routine is out of whack. So I started showing up to work twenty minutes ahead of time. That way, I could sit down, I could drink a cup of coffee, I could, you know, I I could just I could just take my time. Also, not for nothing, if I did get delayed for some reason, traffic or whatever, I had already that was already well built in. It was it was much easier to overcome. I also I learned that going for a walk on my lunch hour was was very very helpful. I was I, I was working in downtown. It was really really easy. So I just started picking different places to go uh, for lunch. I, I would pack my lunch and go buy a drink uh, or, or I would buy my lunch, you know, just, just whatever my financial status allowed. That gave me something to look forward to. I also broke my day down into segments. So I didn't say that I had to work eight hours. I would get to work and I had to work two hours because then I got my first break. Uh, then I had to work for an hour and 45 minutes before I would get an hour lunch. Then I had to work two hours before I would get my next break. Then I had to work an hour and 45 minutes before I got to go home. And I just had little milestones along the way uh, that I would celebrate, you know, you know, on my first break, I would have a latte. On my on my last break, I would have a, a diet coke, and and all of these things just sort of helped me break up the day and look at things in little chunks. I find that it's just it's so impossible to say how do I keep anything at bay for eight hours. So I changed the question to how do I keep it at bay for two hours? How do I keep it at bay for an hour and forty five minutes? How can I chunk it down? to just make it much, much, much more palatable. And that helped me a lot. Uh, and finally, do talk to your supervisor. I, I say this all the time. There, there are things that you can request to help you at work. They're, they're, reasonable and they're reasonable accommodations. You can talk to your supervisor. You can talk to human resources. Sometimes managing your depression does need a little help from your employer. Again, your state laws may vary, but please feel empowered to ask for help from your employer to be the best that you can be because they want you to be the best that you can be as well. Uh, so those are all of the, I, I think Lisa, did we cover everything? Did, 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 oh yeah, did I we think get so, it? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point that your employer has a vested interest in you doing a good job. So they might very well be quite eager to help. Yeah. All right. Let's pop up the next question. Okay. I feel like we should, like that's a dark it's a joke because that's from Gabe. I feel like I feel like depression is still in the workplace right now. This is our workplace, and I'm starting to get depressed that the question hasn't hasn't changed. Um I'm I feel bad for Amanda. She's like they're not even answering my question anymore. And and uh there. Okay, it's gonna change. I like your little logo thing. What is that called? That now. little picture in the corner. I like it. Your profile like picture? a Thank you. I'm telling you, the, I like that. It's cute. The, the question is going to change any minute now. Let's just stare at it uncomfortably. That usually makes me go away. 
No, actually, it does not. <laughs> I know that personally. All right. From uh, Frankie, okay. how to deal with social media when people are quick to label you just seeing your gender, your color without knowing your problems that exist. Lisa, do you want to take this first or do you want me to? Uh, I, I would say I'm not a big social media user uh, because, because of stuff just like this, really. It's depressing and sad. And just keep in mind, these people are lying. You know all the pictures that you put on Facebook? Yeah, you don't look like you really look. That's not what you look like. So yeah, that ain't what they look like either. So all of these people are lying. Just keep that in mind whenever you look at it. But Gabe, you're a real big social media user. So what kind of advice do you have? I, I could talk about this subject in, in like for the entire hour. We, we could do an entire podcast on, in fact, we are now going to do an entire social media. So much to say, my head is like, with all the stuff that I have to say about social media, but I'm gonna refine it down to one thing. You own your social media page, block them. There are, there is, a, with everything that is going on in the world, I learned so many sad things about my friends and their positions on things like race and gender and sex. And I was, I, I'm not friends with some of them anymore, because some of the things that they said or did were just so far, it, it's not even an agree to disagree moment anymore. And uh, I, I felt very strongly that I needed to block them in my real life. So of course that made it very easy to block them on social media. But sometimes people are just annoying on social media. Like the, it, it's, you're, you can agree to disagree, right? You just don't want to see it all the time. Uh, you know, I, I don't follow a lot of my, uh, a, a lot of my younger friends because they're just constantly falling in love and breaking up and then fighting and then getting back together. I just don't want to watch it. I can still be friends with them. Oh, cool. We can get together and watch UFC or sporting events or whatever, but, but I just, that's all you got to do. You won't see it anymore. If you do want to see it because you want to keep up, don't, don't respond to it. But if somebody is cyber bullying you, and that's what it is, if they are labeling you because of your gender, your color, uh, your, your sexuality, et cetera, don't, don't let them be there. Just block them. Finally, remember a troll is a troll for a reason. They are, they are, they are pointless in every way. They, they, don't, they don't represent who you are. They barely represent who they are, except just disgusting and worthless. And, and just remember that. Just delete them and move on. Sincerely, I, I cannot tell you the power in muting, unfriending, unfollowing, blocking, whatever it takes. There is a lot of sadness and horror on social media. The, 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 the racism and the misogyny alone is, is horrific. But one of the reasons that I keep it is, is because of the positives. I don't want to not reach out to people through the mighty, through Psych Central, through doing stuff like this, through helping people because a bunch of trolls kept me off of social media. I don't want to miss out on seeing my sister post pictures of my niece who lives 700 miles away and just changes every week. I want to see those videos. I want to see those pictures. I... I stay away from the politics. I stay away from the religion. I stay away from the arguments. And sometimes that is hard, especially right now. Oh, you know, you know, just like like six months ago, everybody was a constitutional scholar. And then like two <laughs> months ago, everybody was an infectious disease expert. And suddenly now everybody is an expert on systemic racial relations. That's all you need to know. The internet will rise to the expert level in anything that is that has been uh, brought to the forefront of our society. Ignore them all. Most of those people are blowhards that don't know anything. Uh, just, just remember that. Uh, finally, I, I remember Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he said, to know you have succeeded is to listen to honest critics. Uh, he said a whole bunch of other really cool things too. But I, I think about that a lot when people criticize me. I think, are, are you an honest critic? Are you, are you somebody whom I should listen to and respect? And if I answer no, I don't even consider what they said. If I answer yes, I consider what they say, but that, that still doesn't mean that I agree with them. Lisa is an honest critic. I don't <laughs> agree with most of what she says. But I it is too bad. I mean, just, just think of how unhappy and out of therapy I could be if I just follow you. I know, right? See what I did there? 
Uh, sincerely, don't let people who don't know you determine your day. Find the people who do know you and listen to them. Lisa, you ready for the next question? Oh yeah, I oh, was sorry. just gonna say it reminds me of that joke you told me one time about oh my goodness, I've I've discovered this app that tells you which one of your friends and family members are racist or misogynist. It's amazing. And the app is called Facebook. So yeah. yeah. All right, Brittany Hughes. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if Facebook is now monitoring this and our, our number their algorithm is just gonna erase our numbers immediately. We went from having oh, like three hundred people viewing this down to like two. We just we just made Zuckerberg mad. Uh-oh, that's okay. Oh, we'll hang in. Yeah. All right, the next question is from Brittany Hughes. Lisa, you want to read it? Okay, Brittany Hughes is asking, how do you bring up mental health to your primary doctor? How do you know you need to? Well, Lisa. you bring up mental health. <laughs> no, I was going to say, tell, tell all about the sign of the customer. Oh. <laughs> well, a couple of things. One, you are need to remember that you are a healthcare consumer. You want to be nice to your doctor, respectful. He has more knowledge than you, went to medical school, all that, right? But ultimately, he is your employee. You are paying this person. So if you feel like there's things that you can't talk about or, or you're not getting the type of care that you want or the type of care that you deserve, if possible, and I know that's easier said than done with insurance, et cetera, but yeah, find somebody else. And if you can't do that, tell him so. Again, you are paying this person person, employee, you should be getting the care that you've, and you bring up mental health to your primary doctor, this should you, should you bring up, I, I assume you're asking because you're a little bit hesitant to do so, how would you bring up anything else that was a little bit, you don't really want to talk about, right? You know, would you bring up, I don't know, give me something you don't want to talk about your doctor with, Gabe, your well, testicles, you know, let's do with that, yeah. I, actually, that, that's I, I was I was going to say, you know, when, when you're know, younger, uh, sexual side effects, issues, anything to do with it, especially for males, um, you, you know, we're we're we don't we're a weird society in, in, in this way, aren't we? Uh, you know, the, the, the undercarriage of it all, you know, it can be very, very difficult to bring this stuff up. Uh, it would be nice if we had a doctor that just screened for it and asked you, um, you know, but but we we don't always. Um, the I, I want to touch on one thing real quick. How do you know when yeah. you need to? You, now you need you, to. You need to. Yeah. The the, the very fact that you're asking, I, Lisa, help. Thanks. I just yeah. Just, if you if you, she, you know right that there, thing about how do you know if how do you know if you need to go to an emergency room? If you think you might, if if how do you know you need to? If if you're wondering if you need to, then you need to. And especially now it's 2020, the vast majority of doctors, especially primary care physicians, they're really used to this. You, this is not going to be something new or unique or something that this person has never heard. It is extremely common. So th these one, you can't really shock doctors anyway, but this person will not be surprised. If you are worried about it, uh, bring a buddy and ask your your, yeah. your buddy, whether it be a family member, et cetera, to bring it up and say, hey, this is my my son, Gabe, my friend, Gabe, my, my daughter, Brittany, my friend, Brittany, and she has questions about, uh, or, or finally write it on an index card, write yeah, everything that you want the doctor to know, every single thing on an index card, write it on a sheet of paper, type it up. I mean, we all have computers and printers. Uh, and, uh, and and bring it into your next appointment and just hand it to them. Finally, a lot of places now have patient portals where you can literally just type it all in ahead of uh, your, your thing. So those are some easy ways. You know, leave it on their voicemail if you need to. Call in at three in the morning when you know they're not in there. Uh, just however you need to do it, get it out, suck it up, and discuss it. I, I think that you will be uh, absolutely... Uh, glad that you did. We have time for one more question. Lisa, are you okay. ready? This is our final question ready. and then we're going to scoot. Okay, let's see. What's the next question? All right, Elena is saying her question got skipped. Oh. How do you treat try to get to as many as we can. Yeah. And our, our poor uh, off camera lady there, she's really struggling. She has to go through so much. How do you treat your depression when medication is not an option? Well, Gabe, that goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the day. So there, there's, there's, there are many, many, many options to, to treat depression that, that have nothing to do with medication. Uh, first off, we, we cannot rule out the role of, of diet, exercise, and sleep. We, we don't discuss this enough. Uh, if you are eating garbage foods and, and you're getting two hours of sleep a night and you're sitting on your couch 24 hours a day, that is going to contribute to your depression. So right off the bat, some things that you control, uh, you know, try eating some fruits and vegetables and stay away from, you know, fried foods. Stay away from salty. 
just just stay away from junk food. If it has Taco Bell in the title, probably not for you. You know, lean meats, high proteins, vegetables, fruits. These things really, really help. Two, go for a walk. Go for a walk, preferably outside if you can. Sunlight and that exposure, it, it, it's very, very difficult. I, I am a redhead. I burn walking past a television show that's set in California. So I, I understand it. Slap on some sunscreen, go outside, walk around your block. Just, just don't worry about, you know, people psych themselves out. They're like, I don't want to exercise. I don't like to sweat. I don't like to get my heart rate up. I don't like to, I don't like to, I don't like to forget all about that. Walk around the block and have it take an hour and a half. Shuffle if you need to. Just just get outside and 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 get some movement. Finally, sleep hygiene is very important. Go to bed at the same time. Get up at the same time every day. Uh, don't stay up all night. Uh, make your bed a place where you need to sleep. Only use it for sleep and sex. Get the TV and the screens and all of those things out of your room uh, so that you can really maximize your ability to sleep. Those are some things that you can do right now, absolutely free. Uh, it, when we move into the, the 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 medical model of it all, let's start talking about therapy. Therapy is incredibly important when it comes to managing depression. Small coping skills and understanding what's going on it goes such an incredibly long way. Do not disconnect or do not discount the role of therapy. Moving past therapy, do not dis discount the role of support groups. I was a member of a support group called Bipolar Bears for years. I loved this group. I loved it. Lisa was there with me and she just, I would feel they only met every other week, twice a month. And I would feel like garbage going in. Nobody understand me. I'm all alone. I don't, and I would sit in a room with people who got it. They understood. They also lived with bipolar, the, 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 the camaraderie, the understanding, the, the everything. And I would say this, 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 what do you recommend? And people would share ideas and I, I'd try them. Some of them worked. Most of them did not, but I got this buzz connecting with people. And I got this buzz trying, even when the things failed, I got the buzz by trying, being being proactive and moving forward. Um, you, you know, finally, I will say uh, just, 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 just to throw it out there. There are so many medications. When people tell me that medication is not an option, I, I always, you know, just throw up a little asterisk and I say, you know, that's curious. There, there's literally hundreds of medications. Um, have you tried hundreds of medications? Have you tried tens of thousands of combinations and different dosages, et cetera? Uh, and then, you know, finally, if, if it is financial reasons, antidepressants have been around so long. There's so many antidepressants, like on, on the, the Walmart, for example, has, you know, $10 for 90 days. Uh, if you ask your doctor to start with those and to try those. Uh, I, I understand that this is not ideal. Um, finally, Google coupon codes for the newer medications. There's a lot of places that they will help you with your co-pays, et cetera. Um, you know, just look for nonprofits to help. Uh, you know, sometimes the one-two punch of medication and support and, you know, good diet and exercise really will get you there. But again, removing medication entirely from the equation, honest to God, those things will help. Uh, and, and, and please, 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 I suggest that you try them. Lisa, did you have fun? As always, absolutely. And thank you so much for everyone with your questions. Oh, uh, thank you so much. My name is Gabe Howard. I'm the host of the Not Crazy Podcast with host Lisa. We are married, divorced, uh, friends. Uh, we don't know what's going on. But what we know for an absolute fact is that we host the Mental Health Podcast for people who hate mental health podcasts. Check it out now at psychcentral.com slash not crazy or your favorite podcast player. We're on all of them. We'll see everybody <laughs> next week. Well, no, not Bye. next week. We'll see everybody in a couple.